Welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Dhaka Tribune editor Zafar Subhan and I'm in conversation today with Mr. Forrest Cookson, renowned economist, though of course today we're not going to be talking specifically about economic matters. Welcome to the show, Forrest. Thank you. And as I mentioned in my intro, we're not necessarily going to talk about economics. We've just had an election, and I think most people are now looking forward to seeing what other big challenges uh, Bangladesh may face in the future. I think what you and I would like to talk about today is to look at the geopolitical challenges Bangladesh faces, and very specifically, what does, you know, being at the crossroads of Asia with India on one side and China on the other, what does that portend for Bangladesh in the future? Yes, I mean, this is a subject of enormous interest, or should be to everybody. Yes. The, uh, uh, I'd like to begin by saying we shouldn't have any illusions about what is going on in the world. Okay. The United States and China are in a genuine war, not a war of nuclear weapons, but a a war of, uh, of power and influence, and the, there are many aspects to this sure. war. So a cold war? A cold war, yes. Hopefully it will, st it will stay, stay cold. cold. Yeah. The, and I guess that what I think is that the, there's a kind of equilibrium in Northeast, Northeast Asia, mm -hmm. despite the carryings on of North Korea, uh, but South Korea and Japan, the United States, China have a fairly stable position there. Yep. And similarly in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, although there's areas of conflict, mm -hmm. the, uh, these are well settled lines of, of influence. Sure. But South Asia is a different game. Okay. South Asia is uh, uh, the, although the Chinese have successfully uh, built their influence in Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, of course, and Nepal, yeah. uh, and Myanmar. The Bangladesh is still there as... Uh, well, I mean, if, you, if, if you're going to put it like that, then Bangladesh seems to be the last man standing, in a sense. So yes. we should look forward to a great deal of contestation over this space, perhaps, in the next uh, coming years. I think that's what we can expect. Mm. I think the, but I think we should see this in the context of pressure by the Chinese against India, sure. uh, particularly on the northeastern states, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps on the water resources. The uh, Chinese long have been discussing the uh, uh, diversion of the Brahmaputra uh, yeah. in, inside China sure. uh, with the catastrophic impact on both India and, and Bangladesh. And, Bangladesh. That matter, yeah. uh, and there is uh, the whole I set of issues around, uh, uh, around, the, around the borders. Mm -hmm. these, these issues go back into yeah. the Raj time. When sure. the, and, uh, but these are issues that are on the face of it are not important, but can be heated up by the Chinese whenever they wish if they, to. If they wish to, yeah. The, the, there is, of course, the, the history of the 1962 war. Sure. The consequence of that, and what is not well known, is that Nehru appealed to Kennedy to, for help. In 1962, when that war took place, uh, Kennedy was busy dealing with the Cuban crisis. Sure. Uh, but all during 1963, the, uh, the Indians and the Americans worked out a military economic alliance. The yeah. Americans and the Indians were f going to form a, 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 an alliance against the Chinese. Mm. The, that failed to take place because Kennedy was shot and Nehru had a heart attack right. soon afterwards. So the two guys who were trying to do this uh, uh, disappeared from the scene and right. the remaining players had no no interest in they moved building in this directions, alliance yeah. so South Asia turns out completely differently yes. than you might have thought in if in uh, uh, in January 1963 right. when the Chinese will always be cautious uh, mm -hmm. about moves that will 
lead India to we'll bring call the US for help in, yeah. uh, for the U.S. Yes, uh, but nevertheless, the uh, the somewhat whimsical foreign policy of the United States now yeah. uh, might tempt the Chinese. Mm. And furthermore, I fear that the more the Chinese feel pressured by the Americans, they will look for mm -hmm. some place to push back. Yeah. And uh, uh, Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia are not places that they're very well positioned to push back. Right. But here in South Asia, they can mm. make a lot of trouble with, uh, 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 with limited risk to themselves. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you say, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, one of the things which has been a cornerstone of Bangladesh's foreign policy is trying to really play China and India off. We're in a fairly... On the one hand, you could say it's an enviable situation because we have people vying for our favor. On the other hand, that enviable situation could turn into an unenviable one if that relationship between India and China takes a turn south. How, you know, what are the implications for sort of Bangladesh? Is it going to be possible for us to continue to, you know, practice some kind of equidistance between the two countries or will Bangladesh at some point be in a position where it has to choose? Well, I think the the greatest danger that Bangladesh faces is if the uh, Chinese attempt or to uh, block the Siliguri corridor, sure. uh, they actually don't even have to occupy it. They can position their artillery on the on the uh, on the hills and, yeah, and effectively and control it. Yeah. it. At that point, the the Indian access to their northeast states mm. uh, is greatly reduced or even completely blocked. Yeah. Then India will turn to Bangladesh and ask for an agreement to send troops and military supplies uh, through Bangladesh. Sure. And that becomes a but critical a question for, for Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Yeah. And uh, for which there's no good answer for Bangladesh. Right. Yeah, no uh, one wants to be in that position. Yes. And, I think that's the greatest danger of being drawn into this. Uh, yes. On other things, Bangladesh can play it cool and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, stay so at arm's length. Right, but it's, it's important to know that uh, this is something we may have to deal with in the future. Let's hold that thought for now. We need to take a commercial break. We'll be right back. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be right back after the commercial break. This is Straight Talk. I'm Zafar Saban in conversation with Mr. Forrest Cookson. Thank you. This is Zafar Subhan in conversation with Forrest Cookson. Thank you for returning. So, Forrest, we've been talking about India and China and the implications for Bangladesh. Now, what sort of a time frame are you seeing on this? Now that uh, we have Indian elections coming up in, uh, in a few months' time, do you think that uh, uh, this is something where you anticipate China, perhaps, you know, obviously on the surface, no, but under the surface, playing some kind of a role. Is that something one needs to be concerned about? Well, I mean, I think so. I think we've, mm -hmm. we're in a, a time, perhaps it's always been this way, but it is more evident now mm -hmm. that the uh, countries are busy interfering in other countries' uh, politics. Sure. And this is always been the been case. case. Yeah. This is nothing but you new. have a, a greater, uh, a larger toolkit available yes, to you the, now than uh, one did in the past, perhaps. The, uh, in the past, much of this took place through uh, uh, newspaper propaganda. Sure. The uh, Chinese own a newspaper in Bangladesh and use it to, mm -hmm. to uh, I mean, they, uh, they own it secretly, is what sure. I mean, and they use it to put out whatever mm -hmm. they want to put out. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, all over the world, great powers do that, yes. and that uh, the uh, in South Asia, the 
with all respect, the 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 penetration of the written word was fairly limited. Lim- yeah, minimal. But yeah. Uh, now, with the uh, social media, with much greater ex- extent, and much more you can do with it than sure, uh, absolutely, you can reach uh, really far. Yeah. The uh, uh, so the ability of countries to manipulate the social media, and India is particularly vulnerable. They have no uh, limited protection. Uh, yeah. uh, Bangladesh has quite a lot of protection. China has even more. Yeah. But you should never underestimate the ability of the Americans or the uh, Russians uh, to penetrate these uh, these uh, protection barriers. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, the, so the uh, the use of the internet and uh, uh, cyber warfare or, uh, as a way to uh, manipulate elections, to manipulate public opinion. Okay. I think probably we're on the early stages we're of this. We're just seeing it. it's going uh, to become a full-fledged offense. Yes, as people learn, learn more how and more to how, to, mm. how to do it. And the, uh, you saw this extraordinary effort by the... Uh, uh, the Trump campaign to sure. uh, to use uh, psychological analysis to determine how to approach different different sure. people. Uh, this well, is very sophisticated, I think complicated it's very stuff. From what I understand. I I've read a lot about it. They say that you know with a uh, hundred Facebook likes, they can you know they can know more about you than your best friend, with 200 more about you than your spouse, and with 300 <laughs> more about you than you know yourself. Yes. <laughs> Tell me, because of course, when we talk about uh, sort of India and, uh, and, 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 and China, really, of course, the, the real battle, you know, if we're talking about sort of supremacy, if we're talking about uh, advancing Muslim foreign policy, is between the United States. And India is there insofar as it is an ally of the U.S. Where does the, and is there a recognition in the U.S. about uh, the realities of the current situation, um, the reality of the new Cold War between, let's say, the U.S. and China? Well, I I think there is. I think there's uh, uh, an increasing realization Mm. uh, in the American government, in the American academic community, the, uh, there are lots of signs of the American academic community, the part that works on China, that studies mm-hmm. China, of a sense of, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, betrayal is not the right word, but China's doing something that isn't right from their point of view. Right. Well, that, you see, this uh, is, when you, when you know, uh, China was brought into the World Trade Organization. The, the hope was that this would, you know, this would sort of move them in a more liberal direction, and uh, perhaps that hasn't, uh, hasn't panned out the way yeah. the proponents had expected. These, in my opinion, are very complicated questions that I yeah. don't think I understand. But one way to look at it is the, the hope that the uh, Western world had yeah. was that China would join the community of nations. It would yeah. uh, move away from the violence of the Mao Zedong uh, uh, era and that it would... Uh, by international growth of international trade, welcoming China into the international uh, world, mm. uh, that it would moderate uh, uh, yeah. the uh, uh, the autocracy uh, of the Communist Party. Yeah. Uh, this uh, turns out to be uh, a to be a wrong assessment of what would happen. Sure. But we, you know. In, in my opinion, the world is very tricky. Mm. It may be that a liberal China yeah. becomes a more powerful China and right. ultimately ends up having much more influence over the world. Sure. And that's not necessarily bad. I mean, China is certainly the home of the greatest civilization that humanity has produced. Sure. Uh, although that was some time ago. Nevertheless, yeah. you cannot forget Discounted, what they yeah. did. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, and so they, uh, they're a powerful nation. Mm. The, uh, uh, I, I, I give a simple, perhaps facetious okay. calculation. Tell me. The, uh, the, there is work on 
done by a Canadian uh, psychologist on IQs of countries. Okay. And the assessment of the United States is the mean IQ is about uh, 98. Okay. And the mean IQ of China is 106. Wow. That's now, if you take if you say, well, the future of a country is how many people have IQs above 140, mm. and you do the calculation, then you find that the Chinese have about 10 times more than the United States does. Cool. So the war is over. The okay. Chinese have got all the smart people. If China moves, continues to be, allow itself to be dominated by the Chinese Communist Party, mm. if they move more towards a totalitarian state, which Mr. Xi seems to be doing by uh, extending his uh, the term that he can yes. remain as president, uh, by building up the uh, state enterprises. Mm -hmm. This building up the state enterprises and reducing the role of the private sector, uh, which seems to be the direction that China is going, is uh, this will let the West win. Okay. The well, on uh, that <laughs> on that note, we're going to take another break. But we can come back, and you can uh, perhaps expand on that last point. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is Zafar Saban in conversation with Forrest Cookson. I hope you'll join us after the commercial break. Thank you. Welcome back to Straight Talk. This is Zafar Zaban in conversation with Forrest Cookson. Now, Forrest, before the commercial break, we were talking a little bit about how China's, you know, returning back to a more authoritarian, more totalitarian outlook in approach. They had seemed to be in previous years uh, an opening up, and now that seems to have been reversed. But you think actually that could be the undoing of China? is a major power, perhaps? I do. I do. I think what we've seen in the, in the, well, in the economic history of the last 150, 200 right. years is that what works with all the difficulties that it that brings with it mm -hmm. is, uh, is uh, market economies, competition. Yeah. Now, that there, I don't mean to, under, to uh, underestimate the complexities and difficulties that come with this. But nevertheless, this has shown to be the most effective way to allocate resources, sure. to, uh, uh, to guide investment and the, uh, the decentralization of uh, economic activity is much more successful than the centrally planned. I would suggest that surely that in as far as China is concerned, that ship must have sailed a long time ago. But perhaps part of it has to do with power. Though you see, if people become very, very rich, then you know they are able to exercise power and it's harder for a central authority to then control a country in the way it has in the past. Yes. That's that's definitely the case. I mean, the the Chinese uh, had a had basically an an open foreign exchange market, yeah. uh, and that all of a sudden they realized that their mm -hmm. s businessmen and their rich people are busy buying houses in Vancouver yeah. or industries here and or here and there, and all this capital is moving out. Mm -hmm. And at first they thought. I think they thought that's not that's such a fine, bad yeah. thing, but then it uh, it became very large scale. And uh, I mean, so they basically uh, had a choice between, you know, either loosening the reins of their political control or tightening up. Yes. Economically, which would then really maybe not necessarily reverse, but certainly slow down uh, the growth of the last few decades. And they've chosen clearly. They've chosen the latter. They've chosen that, and I think mm. that will. They will regret it. Okay. That the uh, the economy will slow down, and you know the the economic data in China is got a lot of problems, and sure. that uh, the uh, and many people are qu are quite suspicious of what all these numbers mean. Sure. But regardless of the s exactness of them, they 
do tell the general trend and general sure, story, right. and the uh, we will see we will see a slowdown in the uh, in the economy. I think we would have seen this anyway, yeah. because the their export growth could not continue at the pace right. that they were they were going, and it was necessary to develop the consumption inside their economy, yeah. and that will always slow it down. I mean, sure. when you shift from uh, you shift from export driven growth to internally driven sure. growth in a big country like China, yeah. then the growth rate will always slow down. Sure. We've got a few minutes left. I just wanted to bring the conversation back again to the implications for Bangladesh. And specifically, I wanted to uh, sort of uh, hear your thoughts on, you know, we have this uh, situation with the Rohingya crisis in Rakhine State. You have Myanmar, you have Bangladesh. Where does this uh, burgeoning Cold War between India and China, um, where does it situate Bangladesh in this particular um, crisis, and what are the implications there? Well, I think the perhaps India is not so much drawn into this. Okay. The uh, the situation the Chinese face is the American Seventh Fleet mm -hmm. has a dagger at their throat mm -hmm. because the American Seventh Fleet plus the American alliance with Singapore mm -hmm. basically controls the Straits of Malacca. Sure. And most of the energy uh, resources going from the Middle East mm -hmm. to China are going through the Straits of Malacca. Yeah. All of their exports to, uh, to Europe are going through there. Sure, so they want so, alternative routes. So they're desperate for alternative routes, and they're trying to, to build those. One of the best ones is through Burma sure. uh, from the Rohingya State. Rakhine state Rakhine up state, to yeah. Kuming, mm. and they built a pipeline, a couple pipelines for gas and uh, and oil, already, and they have a railway underway, mm -hmm. uh, and at the Rakhine state end of it, the uh, Chinese are building a big industrial estate, which may house who knows, hundred thousand. Yeah. 200,000 Chinese workers, who, who knows what it will be. So, <laughs> so I suppose we're not going to see much, uh, much change from the Chinese on this issue from Bangladesh's perspective. Not at all. I mean, yeah. fr I, th I think from the, uh, from the Chinese perspective, uh, getting the, uh, the Muslims out of the Rakhine state is a good thing. Mm. And that uh, they yeah. Well, they have it earmarked for, for, their, for their route to Kunming. They've got it earmarked for their... A business and investment. Yes, and as I said, I think this is uh, trying to build alternatives to the going through the Straits of Malacca is uh, number one geopolitical okay, so uh, it's objective. It's key to understanding uh, what's, uh, what's going on. Okay, well thank you very much Forrest. I'm sorry we're out of time. I feel like I've had this conversation for you know a long time to come, but uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought, much to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. Okay. And thank you for tuning in. This is Zafar Subhan. I've been in conversation with Forrest Cookson, and this has been Straight Talk. Thank you very much.